This is Clinton, Tennessee. Christmas time, 1956. Population 4,000. That's the high school basketball team in action against Lake City. They lost 63 to 43. Last year they won. Had a good football season this year, in spite of all the recent trouble. Clinton Pep Band plays Rock Around the Clock. And to all outward appearances, it's just another night in just another Tennessee community. But Main Street has not always been quiet. There have been mobs in the square before the courthouse, and riots that had to be broken up by the National Guard. And a white Baptist minister was beaten up on Broad Street. The violence in Clinton was news all over America and much of the rest of the world. But this is not a report on the National Guard in Clinton, or the tanks in the street, or the tear gas, or the burning crosses, but rather an examination after the fact, filmed in Clinton between December 4, when the Reverend Turner was attacked, and now. It is an attempt by See It Now and the citizens of Clinton to explore the chain of events and emotions which brought violence and shame and hope to this town. All the persons to be heard during this 60-minute report will be citizens of Clinton, with the exception of Judge Robert L. Taylor of Knoxville and John Casper of Washington, both active participants in the conflict. Of the 4,000 people who live in Clinton, more than 3,700 are white. And by tradition and custom, most of them believe in separate schools. In 1950, Negro parents backed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, brought suit against the Anderson County School System, which administers Clinton High School, asking that their children be admitted. The Courier News, the Clinton Weekly, spoke for the community in support of segregation. Editor Horace Wells. Well, any newspaper uh, is inclined to follow the, uh, the thinking of the majority of the people in the community, and this community and and I myself have uh, favored segregation all down through the years. Uh, back when this lawsuit was filed in 1950, uh, we did everything we could to maintain segregation uh, by trying to provide the Negro students with good, equal, but separate facilities. And that was the way the community felt, and that's the way the community wanted it. And that was the editorial policy of this newspaper. The federal judge in this section of Tennessee in 1951 and now is Robert L. Taylor of Knoxville. The Anderson County school case was before my court about five years ago. At that time, I held that the colored children were not entitled to enter the Clinton High School because they were being furnished equal but separate facilities. At that time, the equal but separate facility doctrine was the law. The Negroes appealed Judge Taylor's decision, and when the Supreme Court decision of May 1954 ruled against segregation, Judge Taylor's ruling was reversed. On January 4, 1956, he ordered Anderson County to comply. It is the opinion of this court that desegregation as to high school students in that county should be effected by a definite date and that a reasonable date should be fixed as one not later than the beginning of the fall term of the present year of 1956. Accordingly, on August 20, 1956, Approximately 700 students registered for the fall opening without incident. 
Twelve of them were Negroes. Judge Taylor told them all to obey the law, and there seemed to be no questions. Then, another voice was heard in Clinton. John Casper, an outsider, a white supremacist, told them that the law need not be obeyed. Our failure to date has been failing to attack. Failing to attack. Failing to attack at every level and continuously. But we in the White Citizens Council say now, yesterday, today, and forever, as long as there is one living white man in the United States, the Supreme Court is not the law of the land. That decision is not the law of the land now, or it never will be. Never. John Casper first came to Clinton on August 25 and threatened to close up the school if desegregation continued. Casper had certain qualities of leadership, and there were those in Clinton willing to be led. 103 days later, his boast was fact. An organized campaign of picketing, threats, dynamiting, and rioting had brought Clinton to the brink of anarchy. Casper has been arrested twice, but continues to lead the battle against Judge Taylor's order. School attendance, shrunk by parents' fear of violence, was at times as low as 260. The pressure mounted on everyone, the faculty, the parents, the students. This is Jerry Shattuck, captain of the football team and an all-state guard, talking to reporter Arthur Morse in the gymnasium. Uh, how did the students react the first day that, uh, they, that the Negroes came to class? Well, I'd, I'd like to say something about uh, the two or three weeks preceding the time school started. Yeah. Uh, our school starts at the 1st of September, and all through the month of August, of course, we knew we would have Negro students in school with us when we started, but no one said too much about it, and no one seemed uh, opposed to it violently. And uh, then I believe it was the Saturday before the Monday that school started, this Casper came into town, and he started calling people up and stopping them on streets and trying to form pickets uh, in front of the school for Monday morning. And then Monday morning when we did come to school, we found that there were, oh, 15 to 20 people out there with pickets. And uh, the students, most of them were out watching and everything, of course, you know, it was something that they'd never seen before. And then when school started and the Negro students were inside, no one was hostile towards them. Everyone seemed to be friendly. All the trouble seemed to be outside the school among the adults and, oh, I'd say six or seven of the students that Casper had persuaded to pick it. Well, uh, of course, you know that things kept adding on top of each other, and pretty soon uh, the National Guard came into town, and, of course, things quieted down in a hurry then. And then Casper left, and for about a month or a month and a half, everything was quiet. And then this... Uh, uh, the local authorities wanted to try Casper on a sedition and inciting a riot, I think it was. And then he came into town for that trial. And uh, then after that, this intimidation within the school that's happened just recently started. What sort of intimidation was it? They'd go down the halls and maybe push a Negro student. Or I remember they threw some Negro students' books out into the rain one day and they poured some ink and uh, eggs down into a Negro student's locker. And I think they threw a book at a Negro student in a study hall. Uh, Jerry, how do you personally feel about having Negro classmates? Well, I didn't ask for integration, and I wasn't enthusiastic about getting it. But the Supreme Court said that uh, our high school should be integrated, and so uh, I thought that I should do all I could to bring this court order about peacefully. I think. Our football coach uh, put it very well. He said, all through your life, you're going to come up against things that you don't like. But he says you're going to have to accept them anyway and just make the best out of them that you can. And that's the way I feel about it, too. And I think that that's the way most of the students feel. The 12 colored students who came down every morning from Foley Hill also had a lot to get used to. And then Monday morning, when we started the school, there were only a few people around, and I thought maybe, well, they just here to be curious, and they wanted to see us come in, and that they would leave later. 
But then on the next day when things, when more people came and, and the young boys started walking with signs, I began to wonder and think, well, maybe they're not going to accept us like I thought they were. And um, on Wednesday morning, I almost cried to go back home because there were so many people. And they looked so mean. They, they looked like they just wanted to grab us and throw us out. They didn't want us at all. I could just see their hate in their hearts. And when we got inside the school, most of the children were very nice to us. And then there were some, you could tell, that they didn't want us there. They really sh showed it in a big way. They um, put signs on our office and told us to get out, and they uh, threw paper at us, and they shoved us in the halls, and they shoot, uh, threw chalk at us, and said all sorts of nasty things. And it just made me feel bad, and I couldn't concentrate at all on my lessons. But more than on any other individual, the brunt of the pressure was exerted on Principal D.J. Britton, Jr., who had fought the original battle for segregation and was now fighting to obey the law of the land. Uh, Mr. Britton, uh, as principal of Clinton High School, have you yourself suffered any personal harassment since the situation began? Uh, yes, sir. I, I can frankly say that I've uh, suffered nothing but personal harassment. Uh, and other people too, my wife and teachers and students in the school or anybody that took a stand to obey the law. Uh, not necessarily that they agreed with it, but uh, any, any person. Uh, to, for myself, the first uh, day and night, my telephone rang incessantly. I, I guess my life was uh, threatened tenor. 12 times by anonymous telephone callers who would all hang it up. I have uh, since had my phone number changed four times uh, to keep from uh, getting these annoying calls. Uh, I received letters, many through the mail. Uh, I, I received two today, uh, one of which was an unsigned letter, of course, which said that uh, they felt that uh, I was a low-down person and used other vile names and felt that uh, someone should throw acid in my face or in the face of someone in my family and uh, that I wasn't fit to live. Now, I have had a number of those kind of letters. Now, those letters are always anonymous. Uh, they never put a name on them. And uh, our teachers have been uh, called names of all kinds, and uh, they have make it, made it a point within the last few weeks to uh, do anything they could to make it difficult for the teachers. How would you characterize the attitude of most of your pupils in this situation? Uh, they have stood uh, by us loyally in, the, in every test that came up. And we feel that uh, they still do to a large degree. We believe, like, may, we believe that there are maybe 40 students in the school who are creating the trouble that we have at the present time. And uh, subject to this, uh, or before this, uh, an organization, a youth organization, uh, has been organized, which uh, was connected with the White Citizens Council and has their full backing and, uh, I understand, has the same goals. And uh, these people, and I've talked to several of them in the school, uh, are uh, encouraging other people, if not doing things themselves, to... Uh, drive the Negroes out of the school. Now, when I talked to Mr. Casper at the beginning of the school, he wanted to know what I was going to do about getting the niggers, in those words, out of Clinton High School. And I told him that uh, I had three choices, that I could resign my job or I could stay with it and obey the law, or I could do what he said and that I chose none of those except to abide by the law as it was stated. But Mr. Casper informed me that he was 
interested in only two things, and those were one, to drive the Negro students out, and two, to get me out of my job. But here is a matter that is clearly uh, a decision of the United States Supreme Court. And we do not feel that if we uh, allow or teach our citizens to disobey this law, that uh, they are learning the right principles of citizenship. In other words, if they can do that, they can violate any other law or any other decision in the country. We've also been working at the problem of trying to get people to understand each other better and be more tolerant towards each other. And uh, one of the interesting uh, developments of this thing is, to me, has been that uh, I'm now being accused of being a communist. I was born in Tennessee. I've lived my life in Tennessee. I attended Tennessee schools. I attended Merrill College in Tennessee to get my bachelor's degree and master's degree at the University of Tennessee. And uh, if there's anything about me that is communistic, I certainly do not know what it is. And it looks to me like, and I read that some of the uh, attacks and methods that are being used against the schools and against myself uh, lean more in that direction than anything that I have ever done or said. Quite frankly, I think I can feel like many people in Europe feel. My wife and I, since the opening of school, are always careful when we go home. We study the premises. When we get in, we lock the doors and get the lights on. Any noise or any sound that occurs, we are always concerned at what it is. There have been some nights when we have uh, felt that it was the only safe thing for us to do was to stay out of town. We have visited our friends at times. It is just a constant thing which I'm sure that is part of the organization to wear myself and my wife down. It just presses you down every day, lower and lower. And to me it is an amazing thing that an American citizen living in the United States is, has to be subjected to this while the lawless citizens, those who refuse to abide or accept the law, continue to run free. I know this is not a true picture of America. I know it is not a true picture of the majority of the people of Anderson County. But it is a picture of myself and several other citizens in Clinton who have uh, tried to abide by the law. The most talked about man in Clinton is John Casper of Washington, D.C. John Casper, still awaiting appeal of a one-year sentence, is the self-appointed executive secretary of the Seaboard White Citizens Council and a protege of Ezra Pound. Since his two arrests, he is forbidden from interfering in Clinton, but because it is impossible to measure his full effect on the community without observing him in action, we followed him to nearby Kentucky, on December 12, he was speaking to a white citizens' council group in a fourth floor law. The argument simply does not hold that the white race, being a minority, rather being a majority in the United States, should turn over to a group of people only removed from slavery 80 years and only removed from the jungle by a few hundred years, turn over to them the control of our entire civilization. The basis of common law is the custom of the people. And if the custom of the people in Anderson County is to keep the races separate, then the Supreme Court law doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. John Casper on the Ku Klux Klan. In 11 years, in every southern state, the segregation laws we are fighting for today were written, every one of them, by the Ku Klux Klan, which saved the South. And the men who stood 
face to face at Chickamauga, Braxton Bragg and General Thomas, if they didn't have a principle to fight and die for, if they said, well, we'll just let this thing go on, every single one of us here tonight would be mulattoes and not white. Every one of us. John Casper on the people of the South. They underestimated the intelligence and the resistance power of the mountain folk down here in Tennessee and Kentucky. They underestimated that. They thought, well, maybe they were dealing with a group of hillbillies, rednecks, crackers, but those are the real people of the United States. Make no mistake about it. And those hillbillies and crackers, as Billy Branham said, they're the purest white people living on the face of the earth anywhere and the strongest. Among them are men who get on their knees and pray every Sunday, and they pray too. They pray hard. They believe in that Bible, and they believe in Jesus Christ. Mr. Casper tells of his Clinton adventure. When I was in Charlottesville, I saw a little piece in the Charlottesville paper which said that integration was a coming <coughs> in Tennessee. For the first time, the first school, Clinton High School, it happened to be just a day away. And I wanted to find out how the folks felt about it. I didn't think they were for it, but I didn't tell them anything about that. I just went door to door. I showed them a picture of a nigger soldier kissing some white girl. You've probably all seen that picture. Army in the Fort McClellan, Alabama. Some say it's Germany. It doesn't make any difference. There's still niggers in American Army uniforms kissing white girls. Doesn't make any difference whether it's Germany or Alabama. Being done is wrong. Now, uh, I showed them the picture and I asked them if they knew about the niggers going into school the next day, and they said they knew about it, or they heard something about it, or they didn't hear about it. Some of them hadn't even heard about it. And I asked them how they felt about that, and they said, I'm again. What can we do about it? Nothing we can do about it. So I told them something about picketing, and how labor unions operate, I told them to be down at the school the following day, or Monday morning, and I would be there with them, and we'd pick it, and we'd, we'd discuss this thing with the local officials. We'd find out what, if anything, could be done about it. John Casper on politicians. What we are trying to do is regain local control of local affairs, and it is local government, local corruption that we must deal with first. You can hardly expect to have a choice between the hollow pumpkin in the, ho in the, the hollow pumpkin on a pole who's in the White House now and the man who ran against him in the recent election, national election. Two men, both of them, dedicated to stupidity and treachery, both of them. Doesn't mean a thing, either one of them. You compare them to the patron saint of the Republican or Democratic parties, Jefferson or, or Lincoln or any of those people, why these men are nothing our president today. They're just sworn enemies of the American Republic, sworn enemies of the Constitution, do everything they can their power to destroy it and have consistently for 35 years, each, each and every one of them. John Casper on the Supreme Court. The idea is clear, I think, in everybody's mind that the right aim of law is to prevent coercion, either by force or by fraud. And the Supreme Court decision is exactly, precisely fraudulent, precisely coercive. But the Supreme Court is in there for life, and the whole federal judiciary is in there for life, and there's nothing you can do about it. And impeachment is silly. I mean, it's just it's so hard to accomplish that it's probably easier to assassinate a man. Supreme Court, we know they're communists. We know that to combine nine men in the Supreme Court don't make one good civil claims judge. But yet, on the other hand, combined, they make one of the most deadly communist hydra-headed monsters we've ever known. But I'm absolutely confident we're going to destroy that, too. I say integration can be reversed. It can be stopped anywhere provided an attack is made at every single level. 
that meetings of the county court are attended, that the constant self-same demands are made, that people, people keep hitting the judge who made the original ruling, that pressure, tremendous pressure, is brought to bear on that school principal, on the school board, on the local newspaper, or whoever it is that happens to be responsible. There's no sense any longer appealing to Senator so-and-so, or President, or the President, or the Supreme Court judge. It has got to be a pressure down here which is more or less like a lit stick of dynamite, and you throw it in their lap, and let them catch it, and then they can do what they want with it. But let them worry about it. At nine o'clock on the morning of December 4, 1956, was conceivably the darkest hour of the worst day in Clinton's history. The Reverend Paul Turner, a Baptist, was beaten up after escorting six Negro youths to school. There were witnesses. It was, a, it was a horrible thing, and I thought they were actually killing him. Blood was streaming down his face, and even it just looked that blood was running out of his eyes. Um, I asked someone in the group, just anyone, to help him, and when there was no response, I uh, went to him and tried to assist him by pulling some of the men's arms from around his face. And all the time, the men uh, in this group who were standing around were screaming, kill him. And that's exactly what I thought they were going to do. I certainly don't consider that it was um, uh, an act of bravery. It was just uh, a matter of the right or wrong thing to do. And I did what I thought was right. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly not ashamed of the fact that I did. It's just that... Uh, I'm ashamed, really, for the people of Clinton that it did happen in such a nice town where such nice people live. Reverend Turner is 33 years old, has spent all of his life in Tennessee. For about five days, these Negro students, having, of course, the legal right to attend Clinton High School, had stayed home because of harassment and hindrance and heckling and threats upon their lives and incidents that actually would make anybody scared. I chose to take such a stand on this moral principle that as long as the law is the law, as it is in our land, and as long as they did personally choose to come to Clinton High School, their legal right, that they had a moral right to attend unheckled and unhindered and unharassed. It was this that prompted me to accompany them. Though there were quite a few hecklers, we made our way to the high school building without any overt incident. When I uh, emerged from the school building about five or ten minutes later, the hecklers were still there and they heckled me personally. About 300 yards away from the high school, we were far away from where the policemen were doing their duty, of course, in front of the high school. One of the uh, Citizens Council members had stationed himself with about three other men on a corner. As I made my way to that corner, they jumped me. I retreated uh, across the street, Broad Street of Clinton, trying to keep him at arm's length while the other fellows were trying to surround me and to hold my arms and to get me stationary for the beating. I retreated all the way across the street trying to avoid any incident. Finally found myself pretty well backed up against the Bishop Building on the other side of the street. I knew then that I had to do something. And it was at that time also that one man successfully held my arms down and allowed the number one uh, man of their gang to uh, land a pretty good blow upon my nose. It was at that time also that I realized I had to defend myself in some way. And so I took off after the man who had slugged me, pinned him against a, a car, and immediately about uh, eight to ten people were on our backs. After a while, when the police arrived, everybody scattered pretty much. We came up from our position bending over. Uh, I took a hold of the two fellows that led the attack, one in one hand, one in the other, and shoved uh, each of them into the arms of a policeman, and from there they took them on over to the police station. I retreated into a doctor's office. 
But everyone did not applaud Reverend Turner's act, which coincidentally occurred on the same day that Clinton was electing a new mayor. James Meredith, a grocer, running for mayor with the backing of the White Citizens Council, was badly defeated. Claims that the Reverend's action may have swung the election to his opponent. My name's James P. Meredith. I'm operator of the City Food Market in Clinton, Tennessee. I was uh, in this mayor's race here uh, December the 4th, uh, 1956, which uh, I was defeated. Well, about the election, uh, I think there's a lot of misrepresentation. Uh, a lot of it started here in this uh, Clinton Curry News, uh, which is a local weekly newspaper here. Uh, I've been here a resident uh, of this uh, county around 20, a little better than 20 years. Uh, the way uh, he had me represented as if I might have been Jesse James or somebody just come in here on a horse, rode into town and got off, uh, which that was untrue. Uh, I've been here on this street for about 20-some years operating a grocery store. They made it out to be segregation against uh, integration. Uh, as uh, for me, I'm like 95%, uh, I'd say, of the people uh, here in Anderson County, I am against integration. Of of course, uh, we uh, believe in uh, Negro uh, having equal rights, equal education, and equal facilities, but uh, we think they should have them in their own place. As for being endorsed by the White Citizen Council, as uh, everybody knows, uh, I came out in this race on my own. As, uh, my friends came in the store here and encouraged me to run this mayor's race. I was running a good race in this mayor's race up in... Uh, until uh, the morning before the polls opened, why, uh, this minister, he went up on the hill to bring the niggers down to school, and then a few minutes after that, why, the scuffle out here started down uh, somewhere in the lower end of town. That was approximately, I'd say, about 10 minutes before the polls opened. As to whether or not that was political, I, I don't know. My understanding was that uh, niggers wasn't supposed to come to school that morning. But I figure on coming back in either two or four years from now and winning this mayor's race. There were other merchants involved, and some were losing customers because they stood by the court order. This is R.G. Crosno, chairman of the school board. I'm sure there's no doubt in your mind as to my official connection with the dairy company. As president of Norris Premium Incorporated, we too have had threats boycott of our product in a number of instances. We have lost accounts, which we have served 10, 12, 15 years, as a result of my being a member of this particular school board. But I would like to assure you as a faculty and my fellow members on the board, that if it becomes necessary for me to make a decision as to whether I sell a quarter milk or resign from the school board, I would like to assure you here and now that I will not sell the quarter mill, but will remain a member of this school board. Also on December 4th, the principal's wife was knocked down and several white and colored children were beaten. The school board asked for federal protection and at 11.45 closed the high school until order could be restored. Mrs. Eleanor Davis, a mother and a teacher, explains to a PTA group what it was like. We were stunned. There were some who were jubilant. Sure, they had wanted it to happen. And they rejoiced that now they didn't have to go to school and they could keep other people from going to school who really wanted an education. But those were few in number. There were other students who were so stunned they didn't know whether to leave or not. Going down the hall, I found students crying. I found seniors who were bitter because they felt that they might not be able to graduate. Of course, tension had been high, and you can imagine the reaction, the various reactions. After the students left, the faculty didn't want to leave. Somehow, we just couldn't leave. We met together in the faculty room, and we felt defeated. We felt as if we'd waved a flag of surrender, and we didn't want to wave a flag of surrender. 
We didn't want to admit that we couldn't control the situation. It was not until the acquittal of Casper in our local criminal court and the organization of the Youth Council that we began to have a breakdown within the school. The members of the Youth Council were not all students, but among those who were students, we had some habitual troublemakers, disciplinary problems, students who found it difficult to pass, and uh, some of the students who belonged to the Youth Council were so ashamed of the fact that they had to belong that they refused to wear their badges. They had only joined at the insistence of their parents. They refused to participate in any of the troublemaking. I know because I talked with them. There are a few students who have been so sensitive to this situation, to the things that they've heard on, or seen on the outside, that they have drawn within themselves. And they're not the same as they used to be. They're afraid to express themselves. And they've lost that happy, carefree attitude of youth. Of course, we hope that time will heal that and they will be once more their happy selves. Now, I don't think anybody can say enough concerning the courage of the Negro students themselves who were willing to face persecution in their hometown to get an education. The majority of students, and I do mean the majority, have undergone this crisis with great courage and faced it intelligently trying to be courteous and helpful at all times. And I think these students have grown up a little bit as a result of it. That Sunday, with the school still closed and the FBI still in town, Reverend Turner faced his all-white congregation for the first time since his controversial act. The Bible is without precedent as a book, and I personally have no fear that it will ever be superseded. But many have tried to misuse the Bible, trying to justify some low standard of conduct by the very Bible that they profess to love and by the book that never compromises with sin, with pride, with prejudice, or with hate. Billy Graham tells the following story. Shortly after the Civil War in a very fashionable church in Richmond, Virginia, there entered a Negro man one Sunday morning when communion was being served. He walked down the aisle and took his place at the altar to partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper. There was a rustle of anger that swept through the congregation. Sensing this delicate situation, a distinguished gentleman stood up and walking down the aisle, he took his place by his colored brother. Immediately, his magnificent example swept over the spirits of the rest of the people in that congregation, and they followed him to the altar, taking their place there too. This man was none other than Robert E. Lee. My friends, we have been too far away from God. When mobs are able in our land to flout the law, the tragic result is a Cicero, Illinois, or a Phoenix City, Alabama. Here in Clinton, we are not especially against integration. We are not especially against segregation. But we are positively and definitely against the disintegration of our community and our body politic that we cherish above all things realizing that where anarchy prevails, none of us has anything of any value and none of us has any freedoms anymore. And now we realize more clearly than ever before that it is Christ or chaos. May we pray. Principal Britton had invited the county attorney, Eugene Joyce, 
to tell the student body what the law expected of them. I am here this morning in my official capacity as county attorney to tell you what in the future the Board of Education and this faculty will expect of you as students. It is not my intention to tell you what to think, nor, it is my, nor is it my desire to tell you what to believe. But it is my duty to tell you how to act in the future so long as you are students at Clinton High School. To my knowledge, never in the history of American education has it been necessary to read an instrument such as this to a specially called student assembly. I have been asked now to read to you this injunction from the United States District Court of the Eastern District of Tennessee, Northern Division. And this cause it appearing from sworn petition... But even before Johnson the school had been reopened, the long arm of the federal law had taken over. U.S. Marshals had moved into Clinton and arrested 16 men and women accused of violating Judge Taylor's injunction. Their arraignment took place in nearby Knoxville on December 10th, the same day school reopened. Here are eight of the defendants on their way to the courthouse, and here is the voice of the county attorney reading the injunction. That on August the 29th, 1956, a crowd of people agitated by one John Casper attacked one of the Negro children of the school that Casper stated on various occasions that the court had no authority to issue the aforesaid order of desegregation in the Clinton High School and that it should not be obeyed. It is ordered and decreed by the court that the aforementioned persons, their agents, servants, representatives, attorneys, and all other persons who are acting or may act in concert with them be, and they hereby are, enjoined and prohibited from further hindering, obstructing, or in any wise interfering with the carrying out of the aforesaid order of this court, or from picketing Clinton High School either by words or acts or otherwise. The young woman under arrest is Mrs. Zella Nelson, daughter of Clem Dishman. Reporter Morse talked to Dishman at his home on College Hill. Uh, this is uh, Clem Dishman, uh, who's lived in Clinton for 20 years, uh, has his own garage downtown. Uh, Clem, what do you think about the uh, situation here in Clinton? The way I understand it is that my daughter and the rest of these folks here were signed up to be a witness in this little case here of the city of fires of fighting inside the corporation. And they grab them up and they take them over to Nelson and they put them in, put them in jail over there. They even put my daughter in there with, I think it's either six or seven criminal women, the way I look at it, just in a bullpen. And I don't, can't see nothing fair about that. You see, what, I, what, I, what, what needs to be done, the way I look at it now, these, there's only about six or eight of them here that goes to school. I think they claim there's eight. Well, why couldn't them people just go to some other school? They've got a colored school here at Knoxville, and then... Anderson County offered to pay their two issues, furnish the bus, furnish the gas. They even went enough to, went far enough to furnish a colored driver. They asked for a colored driver over here there, just before the pastor went up on the hill to lead them off to drive the bus. There's a notion of going, that much notion of going. Well, he goes up and causes all this trouble, see. The pastor of the First Baptist Church, mm -hmm. Paul Turner, goes up on the hill over here, leads the colored dog, puts them in the school, goes over in town and has his fight. I think the Supreme Court, when they ruled that they have segregation everywhere, I think they kind of misrepresented the charters the way I look at it. Now, I don't, I don't know too much about law, but I, if it'll work in one place, it'll work in another. It'll work in all. You take just a, a nine men outfit or whatever you might want to call it, well, over in Russia, they got the same thing over there. The way I understand, they got the same nine rulers over there. That was the ruling of that country. I don't think that's right. I think that's communist way of doing business. Now, I'll tell you what I think about it. That's just what I think about it. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, what do you think about, uh, about John Casper? I think John Casper's a real man. I think, I think they kind of got him under a bad deal this year and a day stuff myself. Now, I'm just telling you from my personal self, so you're thinking. 
But that, that's what I think about Casper. They don't think he's a fine man nowhere. He just woke us up around here and then the people around here, this government we're living under, the way I look at it, but he just woke us up to the fact that we're just living under anything that might, anybody might want to do around here. This newspaper over here, Wells, I heard him swear on that stand over there, Seth. But he put in that paper what he thought the county needed to know. The man that runs the paper right here in this town. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Dishman. Appreciate it. Good talking to us. You're welcome. Glad okay. I met you. Good. Dishman's daughter is no longer in Clinton High School because her father doesn't want her in a desegregated school. Joanne Allen's father has withdrawn her for a different reason. They're getting out. My name is Herbert Allen, and I've lived in Clinton for 24 years. And I found it to be a nice little town to live in. Very peaceful, very quiet. We never had any trouble in this little town. A thing like this happens. Sometimes we say overnight, but this thing is to be. And quite naturally, some doesn't think it should be. But God said he created all men equal and all men alike. And so therefore, none of us stands above the other person in God's sight. And we, as a Negro race, we are only in Clinton, Tennessee, abiding by the Supreme Court ruling that we'd send our children to the high school in Anderson County. We haven't broken any law. We hadn't went against the court ruling. But we leaving now for Los Angeles, California, not so much so as because of this situation, but that I might better myself and that uh, Joanne might have uh, a little bit more freedom in uh, her school activities and, and in her uh, career. Doing all the excitement, all the things that the people are doing, I was able to accomplish something. I made two A's and a B, and the only bad grade was a C, which isn't very bad, but I wish it had been an A or B one. Um, my teachers were very proud of me, and my parents were too, because they thought I did well, even through all the uh, strain that we did have to go through, because sometimes I couldn't keep my mind on my lessons for thinking about the people on the outside and what they were thinking of. And we're not leaving here with hatred in our hearts against anyone, even those who uh, was against us. We do not hate those people because we realize that those people were just misled and uh, they was trained and brought up the way, that way, that's why, that they were never under, able to understand. Clinton High School resumed four days ago after the scheduled Christmas recess with 655 students enrolled. There were no incidents. Some say that the worst is over, that although there is still little enthusiasm for desegregation, there is now a strong will to comply with the law. There are those in Clinton who say the big change came when the federal marshals and the FBI moved in. Others, among them editor Horace Wells, claim it was Reverend Turner's beating. Another thing that has come about as I think this is largely due to the attack on Paul Turner the other day, was that uh, many of us had stood by uh, unwilling to stand up for integration and yet uh, also unwilling to violate the law. And when Paul Turner was attacked, the, the feeling of the community was more or less solidified. No mere words could have done it. It took some kind of action, a heroic action, uh, something of uh, this beating that was administered to Paul Turner to bring us uh, to the point where we're willing to stand up and say, now, we are not going to put up with being pushed around anymore. Uh, we believe in law and order, and that's what we want, and that's what we're going to have. And that's the reason that uh, the people were willing to go to Knoxville and, and put the matter before Federal Judge Taylor and say, now, we want this order enforced. The trial of the 16 Clinton defendants is set for January 28. There are those who question the legality of the injunction including the attorneys general of three southern states and a few columnists. The courts will decide. As for Clinton, a joint meeting of the junior and senior chambers of commerce unanimously adopted a resolution upholding the desegregation law. In the last four months, we've had a lot of controversial worldwide publicity on Clinton. 
most of which has been brought about by a very small minority of the local citizens. Most of us are peaceful, law-abiding, home-loving people that abhor violence and mob action. We believe in our government and our laws, and the justice is handed down by our courts. Even though our government and our laws and our courts don't always please us as individuals, we as Americans and citizens believe first in, in personal freedom. This personal freedom is not the freedom to form mobs and take the law into our own hands, but freedom to think for ourselves and, if an issue doesn't please us, to use every legal, peaceful means at our command to change the issue. The Bill of Rights is also a bill of obligation. I read that somewhere the other day, but it's good. It does fit. Today, we're not concerned with whether you are for or against segregation, but we're just concerned with whether or not you are for or against law and order. That was Clinton and the law an examination after the fact of what happened in Clinton, Tennessee. This was in no sense an effort to examine the whole complex problem of segregation as such. In other communities, both the problems and the solutions may not be identical to those that were reached in Clinton, Tennessee. Now for See It Now, good night and good luck. This is Clinton, Tennessee, Christmas time, 1956. Clinton, population 4,000. That's the high school basketball team in action against Lake City. They lost. 63 to 43. Last year they won. Had a good football season this year, in spite of all the recent trouble. The Clinton Pep Band plays Rock Around the Clock, and to all outward appearances, it's just another night in just another Tennessee community. But Main Street has not always been quiet. There have been mobs in the square before the courthouse, and riots that had to be broken up by the National Guard. And a white Baptist minister was beaten up on Broad Street. The violence in Clinton was news all over America and much of the rest of the world. But this is not a report on the National Guard in Clinton, or the tanks in the street, or the tear gas, or the burning crosses, but rather an examination after the fact, filmed in Clinton between December 4, when the Reverend Turner was attacked, and now. It is an attempt by See It Now and the citizens of Clinton to explore the chain of events and emotions which brought violence and shame and hope to this town. All the persons to be heard during this 60-minute report will be citizens of Clinton, with the exception of Judge Robert L. Taylor of Knoxville and John Casper of Washington, both active participants in the conflict. Of the 4,000 people who live in Clinton, more than 3,700 are white, and by tradition and custom, most of them believe in separate schools. In 1950, Negro parents backed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, brought suit against the Anderson County School System, which administers Clinton High School, asking that their children be admitted. The Courier News, the Clinton Weekly, spoke for the community in support of segregation. Editor Horace Wells. Well, any newspaper uh, is inclined to follow the, uh, the thinking of the majority of the people in the community, and 
this community and and I myself have uh, favored segregation all down through the years. Uh, back when this lawsuit was filed in 1950, uh, we did everything we could to maintain segregation uh, by trying to provide the... A few people around, and I thought maybe, well, they just here to be curious and they wanted to see us come in and that they would leave later. But then on the next day when things, when more people came and, and the, a young boy started walking with signs, I began to wonder and think, well, maybe they're not going to accept us like I thought they were. And um, on Wednesday morning, I almost cried to go back home because there were so many people. And they looked so mean. They, they looked like they just wanted to grab us and throw us out. They didn't want us at all. I could just see their hate in their hearts. And when we got inside the school, most of the children were very nice to us. And then there were some, you could tell, that they didn't want us there. They really sh showed it in a big way. They um, put signs on our office and told us to get out. And they uh, threw paper at us. And they shoved us in the halls. And they shoot, uh, threw chalk at us and said all sorts of nasty things. And it just made me feel bad. And I couldn't concentrate at all on my lessons. But more than on any other individual, the brunt of the pressure was exerted on Principal D.J. Britton, Jr., who had fought the original battle for segregation and was now fighting to obey the law of the land. Uh, Mr. Britton, uh, as principal of Clinton High School, have you yourself suffered any personal harassment since the situation began? Uh, yes, sir. I, I can frankly say that I've uh, suffered nothing but personal harassment. Uh, and other people too, my wife and teachers and students in the school or anybody that took a stand to obey the law. Uh, not necessarily that they agreed with it, but uh, any, any person. Uh, to, for myself, the first uh, day and night, my telephone rang incessantly. I, I guess my life was uh, threatened tenor. 12 times by anonymous telephone callers who would all hang it up. I have uh, since had my phone number changed four times uh, to keep from uh, getting these annoying calls. Uh, I received letters, many through the mail. Uh, I, I received two today, uh, one of which was an unsigned letter, of course, which said that uh, they felt that uh, I was a low-down person and used other vile names and felt that uh, someone should throw acid in my face or in the face of someone in my family and uh, that I wasn't fit to live. Now, I have had a number of those kind of letters. Now, those letters are always anonymous. Uh, they never put a name on them. And uh, our teachers have been uh, called names of all kinds, and uh, they have make it, made it a point within the last few weeks to uh, do anything they could to make it difficult for the teachers. How would you characterize the attitude of most of your pupils in this situation? Uh, they have stood uh, by us loyally in, the, in every test that came up. And we feel that uh, they still do to a large degree. We believe, like, may, we believe that there are maybe 40 students in the school who are creating the trouble that we have at the present time. And uh, subject to this, uh, or before this, uh, an organization, a youth organization, uh, has been organized, which uh, was connected with the White Citizens Council and has their full backing and uh, I understand has the same goals. And uh, these people, and I have talked to several of them in the school, uh, are uh, encouraging other people, if not doing things themselves, to uh, drive the Negroes out of the school. Now, when I talked to Mr. Casper at the beginning of the school, he wanted to know what I was going to do about getting the niggers 
in those words out of Clinton High School. And I told him that uh, I had three choices, that I could resign my job or I could stay with it and obey the law or I could do what he said and that I chose none of those except to abide by the law as it was stated. But Mr. Casper informed me that he was interested in only two things, and those were, one, to drive the Negro students out, and two, to get me out of my job. But here is a matter that is clearly uh, a decision of the United States Supreme Court. And we do not feel that if we uh, allow or teach our citizens to disobey this law, that uh, they are learning the right principles of citizenship. In other words, if they can do that, they can violate any other law or any other decision in the country. We've also been working at the problem of trying to get people to understand each other better and be more tolerant towards each other. And uh, one of the interesting uh, developments of this thing is, <laughs> to me, has been that uh, I'm now being accused of being a communist. I was born in Tennessee. I've lived my life in Tennessee. I attended Tennessee schools. I attended Merrill College in Tennessee to get my bachelor's degree and master's degree at the University of Tennessee. And uh, if there's anything about me that is communistic, I certainly do not know what it is. And it looks to me like, and I read that some of the uh, attacks and methods that are being used Negro students with good, equal, but separate facilities. And that was the way the community felt, and that's the way the community wanted it. And that was the editorial policy of this newspaper. The federal judge in this section of Tennessee in 1951, and now, is Robert L. Taylor of Knoxville. The Anderson County school case was before my court about five years ago. At that time, I held that the colored children were not entitled to enter the Clinton High School because they were being furnished equal but separate facilities. At that time, the equal but separate facility doctrine was the law. The Negroes appealed Judge Taylor's decision, and when the Supreme Court decision of May 1954 ruled against segregation, Judge Taylor's ruling was reversed. On January 4, 1956, he ordered Anderson County to comply. It is the opinion of this court that desegregation as to high school students in that county should be effected by a definite date and that a reasonable date should be fixed as one not later than the beginning of the fall term of the present year of 1956. Accordingly, on August 20, 1956, approximately 700 students registered for the fall opening without incident. Twelve of them were Negroes. Judge Taylor told them all to obey the law, and there seemed to be no questions. Then, another voice was heard in Clinton. John Casper, an outsider, a white supremacist, told them that the law need not be obeyed. Our failure today has been failing to attack. Failing to attack. Failing to attack at every level and continuously. But we in the White Citizens Council say now, yesterday, today, and forever, as long as there is one living white man in the United States, the Supreme Court is not the law of the land. That decision is not the law of the land now, or it never will be. Never. John Casper first came to Clinton on August 25 and threatened to close up the school if desegregation continued. Casper had certain qualities of leadership, and there were those in Clinton willing to be led. 103 days later, 
His boast was fact. An organized campaign of picketing, threats, dynamiting, and rioting had brought Clinton to the brink of anarchy. Casper has been arrested twice, but continues to lead the battle against Judge Taylor's order. School attendance, shrunk by parents' fear of violence, was at times as low as 260. The pressure mounted on everyone, the faculty, the parents, the students. This is Jerry Shattuck, captain of the football team and an all-state guard, talking to reporter Arthur Morse in the gymnasium. Uh, how did the students react the first day that, uh, they, that the Negroes came to class? Well, I'd, I'd like to say something about uh, the two or three weeks preceding the time school started. Yeah. Uh, our school starts at the 1st of September, and all through the month of August, of course, we knew we would have Negro students in school with us when we started, but no one said too much about it, and no one seemed uh, opposed to it violently. And uh, then I believe it was the Saturday before the Monday that school started, this Casper came into town, and he started calling people up and stopping them on streets and trying to form pickets uh, in front of school for Monday morning. And then Monday morning when we did come to school, we found that there were, oh, 15 to 20 people out there with pickets. And uh, the students, most of them were out watching and everything, of course, you know, it was something that they'd never seen before. And then when school started and the Negro students were inside, no one was hostile towards them. Everyone seemed to be friendly. All the trouble seemed to be outside the school among the adults and Oh, I'd say six or seven of the students that Casper had persuaded to pick him. Well, uh, of course, you know that things kept adding on top of each other, and pretty soon uh, the National Guard came into town, and, of course, things quieted down in a hurry then. And then Casper left, and for about a month or a month and a half, everything was quiet. And then this, uh, the local authorities wanted to try Casper on a sedition and inciting a riot, I think it was, and then he came into town for that trial. And uh, then after that, this intimidation within the school that's happened just recently started. What sort of intimidation was it? They'd go down the halls and maybe push a Negro student. Or I remember they threw some Negro students' books out into the rain one day, and they poured some ink and uh, eggs down into a Negro student's locker. And I think they threw a book at a Negro student in a study hall. Uh, Jerry, how do you personally feel about having Negro classmates? Well, I didn't ask for integration, and I wasn't enthusiastic about getting it. But the Supreme Court said that uh, our high school should be integrated, and so uh, I thought that I should do all I could to bring this court order about peacefully. I think our football coach uh, put it very well. He said, all through your life, you're going to come up against things that you don't like. But he says you're going to have to accept them anyway and just make the best out of them that you can. And that's the way I feel about it, too. And I think that that's the way most of the students feel. The 12 colored students who came down every morning from Foley Hill also had a lot to get used to. And then Monday morning, when we started the school, there were only 